Well, as the uh, aging knight uh, says in the um, Indiana Jones movie, uh, The Holy Grail, after Indiana Jones drinks from the true grail, you have chosen wisely. <laughs> <laughs> and what we're going to talk about in this, uh, in this time is the very last uh, element of uh, economic theory of the working of the market economy. So we've built this up over the last uh, day and a half. Uh, we've seen all the uh, essential, at least, uh, features of uh, theorizing about the market economy, understanding it. Uh, and we're left uh, just with this final uh, point about the rate of interest. So that's what we want to uh, uh, focus on. And we'll do this in three steps as we've uh, done uh, previously. We want to talk about fundamentals first, just to see um, how, uh, how, how we build the theory of the interest rate out of these fundamentals. And then we'll talk about the two ways in which people value action with respect to time. And then once we're finished with that, we'll talk about the rate of interest, the theory of the interest rate. <clears throat> so uh, let's begin with um, uh, the, um, the principle that uh, just like, uh, as we talked about on Monday, uh, when we think about human nature and human action, what it means to be a human person engaged in action, we can uh, immediately recognize that we're finite beings. And because we're finite beings, we make this distinction uh, between ends and means. And uh, then from that, we see that, there's, uh, that we have unmet ends. There must be a scarcity of means. And so we proceed right in that way. We've grounded the, the principle of uh, uh, the scarcity of things in, in the nature of the world. And so what, we, what we're going to do now is talk about the temporal nature of human existence. We're also time-bound beings. We exist in time, right? So we're neither infinite nor eternal. Uh, we're finite and temporal. And because of that, we make uh, two important distinctions. Um, we distinguish between different moments in time, like right at this moment, at lunchtime, uh, Tuesday versus Wednesday, and so on and so forth. We, 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 we notice the distinction between those things, right? We, we uh, recognize that they're different things. And we also then make the distinction between sooner and later. And it's from these two distinctions that the uh, two valuations of action with respect to time uh, stem. <clears throat> So first, let's uh, talk about this principle of the duration of action. <clears throat> and uh, Dr. Rittenauer has uh, talked a little bit about this already, so we, we, we've got some uh, background uh, to, to think about. Um, as Mises puts it in Human Action, uh, when we think about time from the perspective of our action, we divide it into these three uh, categories. There's the time before action and the time during the action and then the time after the action. Or we could say it this way, for every action, it's a choice variable for us to determine when to start the action and when to stop it. The duration of the action is a choice variable for us. And so we can compress it, we can expand it, we can uh, start it at one moment in time or a different moment in time and so on and so forth, right? Then the question is, well, how do we make choices with respect to these options uh, available to us? And the answer is the same answer we've always given, right? We do it according to the valuations we make. We, 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 might, we might value different moments in time differently. We might value sooner as opposed to later differently and therefore, you know, lengthen or shorten this uh, duration of action. Uh, and then as Mises points out, the other uh, important uh, basic point here is that uh, within the duration of action, within that notion, there are two parts. There's a production part and a consumption part. And the production part, Mises calls the period of production. And so the period of production includes uh, what Mises called the working time, or as Dr. Rittenauer explained uh, earlier this morning, the uh, production structure you have to start by extracting raw materials and then produce the intermediate capital goods and then produce the consumer good. <clears throat> and then it may be that once we produce the consumer good, there's maturing time. The uh, flourless chocolate cake has to sit overnight in order to gel into its best uh, form. 
or uh, you know, wine has to uh, uh, sit in a in a, uh, a vat and uh, you know uh, mature before it's uh, consumed, something like that. And then there's the duration of serviceableness of the consumer good that's been produced. Right? So we can we can produce uh, uh, you know an automobile and it has a 10 year durability, and so we can extend the usefulness of the thing over time. Um, by the duration of serviceableness. Uh, Dr. Rittenauer mentioned the different spatulas, right? As a, of course, those are producer goods, but the idea of durability, we can, that's a choice variable for us. This is the point. So every action looks like this. It's a sequence of steps. Once we start the action, there's a se sequence of intermediate action, you know, steps to the action, and then, and then uh, it, it ends at some point. And uh, these choice variables exist for us then with respect to the overall duration, the period of production within that, the, uh, uh, the duration of serviceableness of the good that we produce. <clears throat> uh, and then I'll just mention, just in, kind of in passing, because we're not going to make uh, any use of this notion, but I, just for completeness, this last point, uh, Mises also points out that uh, there, because we're temporal beings and we, we or foreseeing how action will turn out in the future when we act, we also have this notion of the period of provision. So, so we, we're always thinking about, with respect to any particular action, we're thinking about the provision in the future, the realization of the ends in the future over some span of time. And this, of course, this period of provision can actually extend beyond our lifetimes. So those of you who already have children uh, you know, understand this, right? You're, you're doing things now with the anticipation that this will improve their lives once, once you're, uh, you've gone on to your reward, shall we say. Uh, so, uh, right, we could have, this is part of human life. We recognize this right away as being a, a fact of the way that we, we are as human beings. Okay, so that's the, that, that's the basic uh, point. <clears throat> and now, now let's turn to this, uh, uh, this other uh, issue of the valuation, the two, we're going to turn and then examine this question of the two ways in which we value with respect to time. This gets a little bit tricky. This is a, a kind of be very careful in the way you think this out because there are pitfalls involved in this, just like, uh, again, with Dr. Rittenauer's discussion of the capital structure, as he pointed out. <clears throat> but in any case, we want to separate out two different aspects of what we just talked about with respect to action. One is just looking internally at the duration of the action. How do we choose internally the period of production, the duration of serviceableness for any action that we take? And then the other is every time we engage in an action, we place that action in the stream of time, so to speak. We, we choose to start at a particular moment in time and end at another moment in time. So those are two different parameters of choice, right? Two different alternatives of choosing. And uh, this is how Mises puts it. We'll, again, we're going to talk about this in more detail in, the, uh, this, in our next step, but I just want to introduce the, these two points. So Mises uh, puts it this way. He says, there's the time, we all recognize there's the time before satisfaction from an action. This is the period of production, right? We're not getting consumptive satisfaction during the period of production. We start the period of production and we have to go through the whole process, right? And finish it, and then we get the satisfaction. And then there's the time during the satisfaction. This is the duration of serviceableness, right? We can, we can produce a good that's perishable. We can produce a good that's uh, somewhat durable, more durable. Uh, we, we, can, we, we can choose an array of different things that we want in terms of perishable and durable. You know, th th this is what we're doing. <clears throat> And, and so what Mises points out here is this is where the principle of sooner versus later comes in. Once we start a production process, we extract raw materials out of nature, and we begin the steps to produce the consumer good, we prefer to get to the satisfaction part <laughs> of the action sooner. Right? This is what Mises calls time preference. Right? We, for a given satisfaction, we prefer that it come to us sooner as opposed to later. This has to be, though, under, understood in the context of the, uh, of the uh, duration of the action. This is only within the duration of the action. This isn't talking about when we do the action. 
it's talking about just whenever we do the action, whenever we choose to uh, uh, start the action, once we start it, then we prefer sooner to later. Right? The period, we want to shrink the period of production, uh, ceteris paribus, if we could get the same satisfaction. Now, of course, we can't get the same satisfaction with shorter versus longer production processes or periods of production. So we want to uh, discuss that. But that's, that's the issue. Right? And then, and then the, the second issue, the, the point about uh, moments in time, about choosing the timing of an action, Mises points out uh, this, I, and this is a, another uh, great, when I first read this, it's, it's just, uh, it's so pleasing. It's just so aesthetically uh, valuable uh, to read uh, human action or great works, right? It's just, it's, it has an aesthetic appeal. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes you, this comes just in the, the rhetorical flourishes or in, uh, in the semantic way in which things are put. So Mises says, time is an irreversible flux that's, I, maybe that doesn't strike you, but it just sort of strikes me as a quite uh, satisfying way of putting it. It's an irreversible flux. Uh, if, if you want to say this in a more you know, explanatory way, as I've got on the slide, each moment actually has a unique place in the sequence of moments of time. That's what he's saying. Moments are not homogeneous and interchangeable. Not every moment in the, in the sequence of moments in time is the same. In fact, they're all uh, uh, different. They're different precisely because they come after one another. And things change as time moves on, right, through, through action. <clears throat> uh, now, bec if, so, because that's the case, it might just be because the, the moments in time are heterogeneous. They're not homogeneous, right? They're heterogeneous. It might be that certain moments in time, if an action is taken at that moment, it would uh, convey to us greater value than if the action were taken at a different moment. Just because different moments in time will provide different conditions for the uh, subjective value that can be attained from an action. Okay, so again, I, I'm not, this is not an explanation, but just I wanted to introduce these notions and then we'll go to the explanation. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to do these in reverse order. I'm going to take the second first because, again, this one has nothing to do with interest rates. That's what we want to show now, that the timing of an action, this question, is not the uh, foundation of interest. The foundation of interest is from the intertemporal, uh, uh, choosing to start an action, committing resources to that goal, giving them up, in other words, surrendering them to that goal, and then only obtaining the uh, satisfaction later. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we'll call this, the, again, the timing of an action. We choose with respect to the timing of an action, and, and this is the point I just made, that the value of a good that we use in action can vary depending on the moment that we use it in action. And so uh, because of that, we will always allocate um, or, or we'll always consider in, in the allocation of an action, we'll always consider this uh, value difference, right? It may not be determinative to us because other, th other things could be different uh, too if we take an action at a different moment in time. But uh, this is the, the basic point. And so just one, uh, one uh, example of this. Uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, our wedding anniversary is uh, November 17th. We were married uh, November 17th, 1983. So just like with... Uh, Dr. Ridenauer, we, we've gone through several uh, mixers. <laughs> so, uh, and this is a good thing, a wonderful thing. So, so in any case, um, you know, we'll celebrate our anniversary. But I, I guarantee you that, uh, especially for my wife, it has more value if we do it on November 17th than if we do it on November 1st. Or, you know, heaven forbid, if we, if we you know, I forget, and we do it on December uh, first, that would, that would really lower the value, right, of, uh, of uh, the same event. Uh, it would change uh, just based upon the moment in time. Uh, okay, so, that, so this is what we're speaking about, right? Notice, notice the, the principle here is I, we don't have to commit any resources at all now, sooner, as opposed to later in that, in that respect. We're just, we're just saying we're, gonna, we're just going to commit our resources at the moment that we want to do the action. Not, not now. We're going to, you know, whatever, you know, uh, decide on a fancy place to go to dinner and I'll get some roses and so on and so forth. But I'm, I'm not going to do that now. I'm not committing anything now. I'm just, we're just saying we'll do that 
in, in due time. And then once we decide it's going to be November 17th, then we'll have to start the action, right? So we'll have to start the action up to secure the roses and, you know, the cake and, what, you know, whatever else we do. That's the duration of the action. That's when the action is, that's when we look at the duration principles of the action. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, now let me change my example to go to the market. Um, so here, let's just, uh, let's just look at uh, this example, just because it's a, a, um, a well-worn example. <clears throat> uh, let's say we look at a commodity price. Let's say the price of oil. And we look at the spot price that is the current you know, purchase trade price. And it's $30 a barrel, or whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but let's just say it's $30 a barrel. Now, people who are involved in using oil as a producer good, and you know they're buying and selling it, and uh, and so on, they're extracting it, and and then refining it, and <clears throat> they would also be they would they would be interested not only in that price, the spot price, but in what the price w will be at some moment in the future. And if they form the expect, let's say they form expectations, financial traders and others involved in this, they form expectations. That uh, you know the the uh, the fake uh, pandemic is going to end, and we're going to be the lockdown's going to end, and things are going to go back to normal, and uh, you know we'll have a pretty normal array of um, demands for oil-based products and so on, and so in six months the the price of oil is going to be sixty dollars. At that moment, they're saying, six months from today, it's going to be sixty dollars. Uh, so they, they they start to form these expectations, right? Well, they can they can make contracts today called forward transactions, uh, not committing any resources today, but just agreeing today to trade at sixty dollars a barrel in six months. Uh, you know, you, they have to obviously they have to have different speculations, but if they do, you have reverse preferences, and they can make trades. So we can get forward prices. Forward prices then give us the, the uh, market uh, manifestation of the timing of action. They're just, they're just, they're nothing more than that, right? There's nothing intertemporal going on here. People are just, are just assessing what they think the future price of a good will be. <clears throat> they're not committing themselves any resources until that day, just like. Uh, 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 I was uh, suggesting I would do uh, with respect to uh, my anniversary. <clears throat> now, if if it's true that the that the uh, forward price was sixty dollars and the and the spot price were thirty, then there would be, of course, a profit opportunity. There's a higher value for oil in the future, higher price for it, right? And you could earn profit by uh, transferring the the oil use from the present to six months from today. But again, to, to, in order to do the contract for this, you don't need to actually own the oil. In fact, it's, it's sort of incidental as to how you come to own the oil in the future to provide the good. Whether you see you're a, uh, an oil producer and you refine it and you're just holding it in storage, or whether you just go into the spot market and, and buy it, right? It, uh, that, that's immaterial. <clears throat> so, uh, so again, there's no intertemporal dimension here. And then, of course, as the oil is, as the supply of oil is being shifted to the future date, the the prices, the spot price and the forward price would come together. Just this is just the same process that we have in any market that we explained again on Monday. Right? This is the, the efficient allocation temporally of a good from one moment in time to another moment in time to another moment in time. Uh, okay, so that uh, set, having set that aside, let's uh, get to the main uh, point. And by the way, I'm uh, just my caveat is uh, you know there are a lot of nuances and difficult you know <laughs> things we have to think out more carefully than I'm suggesting here. I'm just sort of giving you introductory discussion of these issues, <clears throat> um, and then we'll save the the difficult stuff for uh, for Q and A. Uh, okay, so let's go to time preference and the uh, intertemporal uh, dimensions. So this is how uh, time preference is typically defined, or I think I, uh, maybe I should say it's best defined. <clears throat> um, that the uh, satisfaction, a given satisfaction, is preferred sooner to later. So this is what we had mentioned before from uh, Mises. Now here we want to stress uh, another point uh, because again, uh, oftentimes people 
conflate two different notions of preference in general even, as well as time preference. <clears throat> what, what we're um, using these terms to refer to is something, as we've said, embedded in the nature of the case. It, it simply can't be otherwise. In other words, you cannot come up with a counterexample uh, showing that uh, a, a person acted uh, contrary to his or her preferences. There is no such thing. This is just what we mean by the word preference, that a person's choice and action is always consistent with their preference. That's what we mean by it, right? And so it doesn't do any good to try to come up with counterexamples. So we're saying the same thing about time preference. This is also true of time preference, if we're right about the logic of this. It's embedded in, in, in uh, human nature. And therefore, there are no counterexamples. Every counterexample just is misunderstanding what time preference is, or it's, uh, you know, it's confusing timing and time preference. It's confusing these two distinctions we made before, the duration of the action and the moment in time when it's taken, or something else like that, right? It's, uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, so I, I won't go into any examples, but you, you've read in the literature some of these examples. Okay, and then I have one quote, j just again to sort of uh, have this in Mises' words. This quote from uh, Human Action, page uh, 480, in the Scholar's Edition. So he says, and this is all in, uh, these are different paragraphs, but the, it's, a, it's the same text. It's running down to a new paragraph. So there's no separation in the text between these two quotes. Other things being equal, satisfaction in a nearer period in the future is preferred to satisfaction in a more distant uh, period. Disutility is seen in waiting. So that's how he defines time preference. Right? Satisfaction in a sooner period is preferred to satisfaction in a later period. And then he adds this aside, disutility. There's disutility seen in waiting. And then he goes on and says, this fact is already implied in the statement stressed in the opening of this chapter that man distinguishes between the time before a satisfaction is attained and the time for the duration of which there is satisfaction. This is the point that I, I made in the previous slide, right? A person, in every action, we always distinguish between the period of production and the duration of serviceableness of the good that we've produced. Right? That, that's just in the nature of the case. And once we distinguish between those, these two, then, then we just see right away that we must prefer to shrink the period of production and extend the duration of serviceableness. It's just, it's just in the nature of the case, right? It's just what it means to be human, to, uh, to have this preference. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so uh, that's a Mises on these points. And now we want to talk uh, just uh, f about the implications. So time preference is just an implication. It's a logical implication of, uh, excuse me, uh, interest, the pure rate of interest is just a logical implication of time preference. But there's another implication that I want to mention just so we can, you can connect uh, things that uh, have already been discussed. So this is back to uh, Dr. Rittenauer's talk this morning. Time preference determines, or maybe we should say the rate of time preference, how intense people's time preferences are, determine the intertemporal production choices. And so, so this is the basic claim, right? These are, as I put it on the slide, regulated by time preference. So whether, uh, whether we choose to engage in shorter production processes or longer and so on, that is all regulated by uh, our time preferences. And with lower time preferences, we'll engage in longer, more productive production processes. And with shorter time preferences, period, uh, people would engage in shorter, less productive production processes. So this is the idea. Notice uh, other implications come from this uh, pretty quickly, like uh, this one. At any given moment in time, if you just have kind of a snapshot view of the economy, it must be the case that entrepreneurs have already engaged in the shortest, most productive production processes that they have available, you know, that they've created or see of, as possible. <clears throat> they won't engage in, of course, they won't engage in shorter, less productive production processes because of time preference. And in order to engage in uh, longer production processes, they would have to be more productive than the shorter processes. So you see there's a certain uh, logic of uh, the, the, the whole configuration of the capital structure. Um, uh, Dr. Newman will talk about this in the lecture on, um, on the business cycle theory. This, be, this is kind of a, it's not the most important point, but it's a, it's a key uh, element of understanding the cycle. 
um, where uh, the capital structure gets artificially lengthened out. Well, why does it have to do that? Well, this is one reason why it has to do that. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, then let's go to the, to the uh, pure rate of interest. And here we've given a definition. So the pure, the pure rate of interest, we're isolating just the time preference premium of present money over future money. So this is not a full analysis of the, of the market rate of interest, which uh, has other sources to it besides the time preference sort. There, there are other causes of, uh, uh, at least potentially in principle, there are other causes of market rates of interest besides the time preference, besides the pure rates. So, so in order to have, uh, have this clear, keep this clear, we'll call this time preference interest rate, we'll call this the pure rate of interest. This is uh, Rothbard's terminology. <clears throat> uh, you'll also notice that this, is, this uh, pure rate of interest is always expressed uh, in money, in the exchange of present money for future money. It's never expressed in terms of goods. In other words, no, nobody engages in uh, intertemporal trade in goods. Uh, this, this, by the way, is a, a rather important uh, side point to this whole discussion because, as we mentioned, uh, I think, uh, yesterday, <clears throat> uh, the neoclassical general equilibrium model of the economy doesn't include money. There is no medium of exchange in it. They're just barter goods. And if they're just barter goods, how is the interest rate expressed? And the answer is it's expressed in goods. It has to be because th that's all there is in the model. There's no medium of exchange. But if it's expressed in goods, you've, you've got a big problem, which is if you actually had an intertemporal exchange of different goods, the, the interest rate, <laughs> the relation between the future price and the present price would be, uh, would be radically different across the different goods. Why is that? Well, it's, th that would happen because different goods have different future prices because of the moment in time when <laughs> they're, they're taken, right? They, they would have different forward prices. And by the way, those of you who know about finance, you know that these, as I mentioned this point already, I guess, forward prices will come into relationship with spot prices through this arbitrage. But they won't be exactly equal. There'll be a difference. And the difference is the interest rate. Well, and, and other ancillary things like, like storage costs and so on, right? You see, you can't explain the interest rate that way. The interest rate is what explains the, the difference between the forward price and the, and the spot price. You see, this is all, there's a lot of confusion in this area, a lot of difficulty, right, <clears throat> that we have to think out uh, carefully. So money is used because money is the, uh, it provides us with the unit of uh, economic calculation for all people in all places and in all moments of time. It, it, it's a uniform, homogeneous unit of economic calculation the dollar. This doesn't mean, again, that the dollar would have the same purchasing power necessarily in the present and the future, but uh, we can account for that, right? What, what money doesn't have is all the vagaries of uh, shifting consumption demand and demand for producer goods that exist for all the other goods in the economy. Money has demand only as a medium of exchange. And so w whatever vagaries it has can be um, anticipated and adjusted for. And, and so we get a single uniform uh, pure rate of interest when uh, money is used as opposed to uh, exchanging in goods. And this allows us then to have efficient intertemporal allocation of goods. <clears throat> uh, so that's the way the argument runs out. Okay, now let's go through the nuts and bolts. <clears throat> uh, the nuts and bolts again are uh, just going back to the, the um, discussion we had on uh, Monday, uh, Monday morning where, uh, and I've reproduced this, right, real briefly, the first three steps of price theory uh, that we talked about uh, on Monday are that people have preferences for consumer goods. These preferences uh, are, are sometimes are reversed. Uh, and when they're reversed, then trade can take place, mutually advantageous trade can take place. And then the um, um, market clearing price uh, is uh, uh, forthcoming in to, to facilitate these trades. And so there's nothing behind the price of consumer goods in this theory except uh, people's preferences. <clears throat> now, it might, I might add here just a note, just so again we're not uh, thinking wrongly uh, about this claim. It, it's perhaps better to put the claim this way. Anything that can affect the price of a good only does so by changing people's preferences. 
or influencing their preferences. Then, then their demands and supplies will change and then the price will change. But if this, if this causal factor that exists outside of a person, you know, situation or other people doing things that they weren't doing before or whatever, uh, is to affect the price, it has to change the person's preferences who are in this market demanding and supplying the good. Th that's the argument, right? It's not that preferences are the end all of everything. It's that we have no scientific theory to explain how these outside factors um, uh, change preferences. We, we, th there is no theory like that. And so scientific economics must begin with preferences as a given. We're not saying that that's true in, the, in real life, right? We're saying we, th that's our theoretical uh, framework and we can, we can then apply that to real life where, where all these situations are changing and then people's preferences change and prices change and so on. So we're going, to, we're going to argue then the same thing about time preferences. People have time preferences. We can have some who are uh, more intensely uh, prefer the present satisfaction, those who less intensely prefer present satisfaction. They can engage in mutually advantageous uh, trade of present money for future money, and the pure rate of interest uh, emerges. <clears throat> um, so uh, let, let me uh, then run through uh, just a quick numeric example like we did with uh, uh, Caruso's preference ranks before. Um, let's suppose we have person A uh, with the preference uh, rank uh, uh, as I've depicted. Uh, so you'll notice, of course, that time preference dictates that you'll see on, the, uh, on both uh, sets of preference ranks that $1,000 today is ranked above $1,000 a year from today. It's at the bottom of each preference rank. That's because of time preference, right? If present satisfaction is preferred to a future satisfaction. Uh, we're assuming the purchasing power of these funds are the same. But there might be some amount of future money that would be preferred to uh, this, this uh, principal amount of present money. And for person A, it's uh, $100. A $100 premium would be sufficient to get person A to part with $1,000 today in order to get $1,100 in a year. So that's the intensity of uh, uh, person A's time preference. And you can see then that person B has a more intense time preference, right? a higher rate of time preference. Uh, in order to get uh, person B to sacrifice uh, 1000 today, uh, the premium would have to be $300. Um, so uh, person B's uh, time preference interest rate is 30%, and person A's is 10%. In, in my example, right? So obviously they can make a mutually advantageous trade at any interest rate, any pure interest rate between 10% and, uh, and actually 29%, right? <laughs> because person B won't, won't pay $300, uh, but he would pay uh, $290 to get a maximum amount, right? To get 1,000 a day. <clears throat> uh, okay, so that's the idea. They would just get together and I mean, they could uh, conceptually, if they get together and find out about these preferences, they could trade. They could, uh, uh, person A could be the, the lender of present money, uh, and person uh, B could be the borrower of uh, present money. Uh, then the only other thing we have to do, of course, is uh, uh, introduce a competitive uh, bidding and offering, just like we did again on Monday for goods in general. We, of course, in a market economy, we'll have more than one potential uh, lender with lower time preference and more than one potential uh, borrower with higher time preference. And the interest rate uh, uh, produces the uh, maximum amount of social cooperation between them. The market, when the market clearing rate is achieved, then uh, it's achieved precisely because that will allow all of the lenders to find a borrower and all of the borrowers to find a lender. And uh, it creates the maximum amount of social cooperation in, 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 uh, in the market. And so again, there's nothing different here than, than we argued on Monday. It's just a general um, explanation of uh, uh, preference and demand supply explanation of uh, the rate of interest. <clears throat> uh, now let's deal with, uh, well, let me just summarize and then we'll deal with one other issue. So up to this point then we've, uh, we've noted that uh, time preference determines two important, uh, it has two important effects or determines two important things in the economy. It determines first the pure rate of interest and it determines the amount of present money lent and borrowed. Uh, and by the way, this is not um, uh, unusual. It's not so, something weird to the interest rate, right? This is true for all market prices. 
So the demand and supply, in other words, uh, and preferences that stand behind them, determine the price of every good and the quantity of the good traded. It, it simultaneously determines both those things. So it determines, as Dr. Rittenauer is pointing out, it determines the extent to which there's saving that can then be invested. Okay. <clears throat> um, and then I want to just emphasize this uh, point that I made before about um, money performing the uh, uh, unit of, uh, of economic calculation function across time. And, and so I've just reproduced a simple example of compounding and discounting with the present sum. And so what, what the interest rate is doing is get, making the alternative to someone who participates in lending and borrowing, is making the two alternatives of monetary sums exactly the same. You can either have $1,000 in your hand today, or at a 25% interest rate, you can have $1,250 in a year from today. Those are exactly, they're, they're made equivalent, right? <laughs> and then, of course, the, if there's different purchasing power of the money in the future, that can be adjusted for. So, so this is just another uh, piece of evidence that it's money that's used here always in intertemporal exchange. So if someone is to acquire through production the sale of a good, $1,250 in a year, that entrepreneur will be willing to pay $1,000 today for the, for the factors of production. So th those two sums are made equivalent by the interest rate, right? This is, this is how the interest rate is, is uh, regulating the intertemporal activity of production. <clears throat> okay, now let's, uh, uh, this is the last uh, step we'll take really. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, different components of the time market, the different options for lending present money um, and borrowing present money. And uh, this is just uh, straight from Rothbard. So Rothbard uh, very uh, helpfully uh, divides this into credit markets and the capital structure. So credit markets are when uh, <clears throat> people engage in uh, lending and borrowing, uh, uh, supplying present money and demanding present money, uh, where, the, where the contract between them is not uh, uh, fulfilled until the future. <clears throat> so uh, you, know, you, have, you take out a mortgage and then you as the homeowner, you get the, mon the, the funds, right, and you pay the uh, builder. Uh, but but the, that's just the first step of the contract. The agreement, uh, the lending and borrowing agreement isn't finished until you make your last payment. So that's called a, tr a credit transaction. Anytime uh, the fulfillment of the uh, contract is only uh, done in the future. And so there are lots of different kinds of credit transactions, right? And then it, within the credit markets, there can be uh, uh, borrowed money that's used to buy consumer goods. So we say the consumer loan markets. And then we could subdivide those, right, in, I mentioned already, the mortgage market or the auto loan market or the general merchandise market and so on and so forth. And then there's the producer loan market, where entrepreneurs go into uh, um, credit markets and they borrow contractually, right, and then pay back the money over time. So the bond markets and commercial paper markets and so on and so forth, these uh, producer loan markets. <laughs> and then there's the capital structure. Uh, so once again, as uh, Dr. Rittenauer was explaining uh, this morning, uh, here entrepreneurs um, uh, borrow from the capitalists or they provide their own capital funding. They save and provide their own capital funding. And then uh, by uh, inputs, that's a cash transaction, right, for them. It's not a credit transaction. They just buy it and get the service. And then they uh, uh, own the c command over the services, they produce a good, and then they sell it to a different group of people at some future moment in time, right? at the end of the production process. Uh, another cash transaction, they sell. I'm not saying they can't sell on credit or anything. I'm saying the, the, uh, there's no credit transaction between the, the lending of the money by the entrepreneur and the receiving back uh, of the money um, uh, from the consumer. There, there's no contract there, right? Uh, okay, so there's just this uh, structure, uh, there's just this production process within the capital structure. <clears throat> and as Dr. Rittenauer already explained uh, this morning, uh, the size of the time market, this, the amount of saving and investing in the economy that goes into the capital structure dwarfs uh, the size of the uh, consumer loans. Uh, hopefully you see already that all the producer loan funding goes into the capital structure. That's the reason the entrepreneur is borrowing the money, right? He's going to buy inputs. And so that's really just part of the capital structure in that sense, right? 
Uh, one last point on this. Uh, I'll just uh, note that uh, the typical neoclassical treatment of, of the loanable funds market tends to focus just on producer loans, right? So you'll see this kind of treatment, especially, say, in uh, Keynesian you know, liquidity preference uh, model of uh, 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 the interest rate. Uh, that, again, is not very robust, right? Sure, they're, they're producer loans, and we need to analyze that. But ha we can't really analyze that unless we embed it properly in the broader market in which it's a part of. Uh, otherwise, we're just we're thinking about it wrongly, right? We're thinking about it uh, isolated, and this this will uh, we're ignoring these interconnections that, um, that exist. So that's the, the next thing that I want to mention, and this is just a simple example of this interconnection. Suppose we have consumer loans. Uh, uh, suppose the uh, loans look uh, demand and supply look like this, and we have a we we'll start at point A, and we have a very low in, pure interest rate of R sub zero. But in the capital structure, and uh, you know, entrepreneurs are earning uh, an interest rate much higher. They're earning R zero at point A in the on the right hand panel. Well, this can't persist, right? Not not if these are just pure rates of interest. If there's no difference between these loans uh, that the capitalists might make into consumer or uh, uh, production loans, uh, then th th this uh, interest rate difference will be arbitraged away. Right? The, the uh, supply by the capitalists of the loanable funds will be shifted uh, um, uh, out of uh, consumer loans where the interest rate is low and into uh, 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 loans in the capital structure uh, where the interest rate is higher. But as this happens, the interest rates come together. And so the interest rate in producer loans depends upon the interest rate in consumer loans, depends upon interest rates that uh, permeate the capital structure. They're, they're jointly determined, so to speak, right? They're de determined by this uniform process. They can't get very far out of sync with one another before the arbitrage process would uh, earn profit for the uh, entrepreneurs who, uh, who uh, 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 um, see this and uh, act upon it. <clears throat> um, I want to make one last point on this, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll just uh, I want to make a summary point that because I've been ignoring these other factors that affect the interest rate. So here I just I just uh, cited an example, and we I'm not going to run through this. You could just read this from the slide uh, about how not only will this pure rate of interest be the same across the uh, uh, credit loans and the capital structure activity, it will be the same in every production process in the capital structure as long as we're just looking at the same time dimension for production. Right? <clears throat> and so the point that, but the point I want to go on to now is the, this last point, um, because again, there are a lot of theories about uh, the interest rate, that the interest rate depends upon the productivity of capital. Uh, but uh, this, this is, a, again, a, a widespread but uh, fallacious view. It's neat. So as I put it here, neither the physical productivity nor the value productivity of assets can affect the pure rate of interest. And uh, Dr. Klein talked about this already uh, yesterday, but I'll just, so I just uh, kind of reproduce a simple example of this. Uh, let's suppose that the, uh, an entrepreneur has a production process with marginal revenue products from the factors. Uh, these are capital, land, and labor in order, C, N, and L, uh, in one year. And they're 10,000, 5,000, uh, 2,500. So in other words, he's going to produce a good and sell the good for 17,500. So these would be the marginal revenue products that he's going to earn from that. We'll assume the ERE, there's no profit here in my example. And then the question is, how much will he pay today, uh, uh, right now, to get the, those funds a year from today? And if the interest rate is 25%, the answer is he'll pay $8,000 for uh, the capital that's uh, 10,000 divided by 1.25, right? Discounted by the rate of interest. And so on, 4,000. So you see the prices of the capital goods adjust to the interest rate, not the other way around. It's not, it's not that you, know, you can suddenly earn a gigantic interest rate because future prices are higher. If future prices are really higher, what's going to happen is the uh, entrepreneur is going to bid for the inputs today and drive their prices up. The inputs that can uh, uh, capture those higher prices. It's just another arbitrage opportunity or a profit opportunity from different price structures, right? <clears throat> and the interest rate, though, is, is what determines how close together they come. And, and, and this is the main point. <clears throat> OK, so then I'll finish up 
that slide, by the way, just re reiterates what Dr. Klein talked about, so I'm not going to go over that. I'll finish with uh, this slide on the sources of market rates of interest. So if we look at any pure, or excuse me, any uh, market rate of interest, um, it, it could have at least in principle four different component part. That is four different causes. One we've talked about at length, the pure rate of interest. The pure rate of interest then would also uh, generate a yield curve as long as time preferences are more intense for uh, further out into the future satisfactions, as long as even later satisfactions are less preferred than even sooner ones, then you would see uh, an upper sloping yield curve, right? You'd see higher interest rates for longer term loans and shorter interest rates for shorter term loans. Uh, then the second source of the market rate of interest is entrepreneurial uncertainty. So every different production process or every grouping of different types of production processes could in principle have its own uncertainty uh, associated with it. So in order to give incentive for capitalists to lend into those production processes, uh, uh, it might be that uh, they would command a higher rate of interest to, to provide compensation to assuming that uh, uncertainty. Then there's the price premium. The price premium uh, comes uh, about in the interest rate because of uh, changes in the money relation. And the, the changes in particular in the money, well, the last two come about because of changes in the money relation, but the particular one that we're talking about here are what are usually called Cantillon effects, the disparate effects on uh, various prices from an increase uh, in, so let's say, the stock of money. So if the money supply is increased, uh, then some prices will go up sooner and some later. Some prices will go up to a greater extent and some to a lesser extent. So if we have a production process uh, it, it located in the mix of this where the prices of the output go up sooner and to a greater extent, the net income that accrues to that uh, production process will be greater. And this again would be embedded in a higher rate of return uh, for that production process. Again, this has to be unanticipated. Right? If everybody anticipates the Cantillon effects, well, then, then they bid up the asset prices already, and you wouldn't see this. <clears throat> and then there are un unanticipated changes in the purchasing power of money. And the same thing, right? It has to be unanticipated. In other words, if most people don't anticipate that the purchasing power of money will be lower in the future, but a couple of people do, uh, then they will only be willing to make uh, um, uh, lending and borrowing agreements at a higher interest rate that incorporates this this declining purchasing power of money in the future. <clears throat> uh, there may be uh, you, you know, other um, conditional features that affect interest rates, but these again are the, considered to be the uh, sort of theoretical ones, right? The theoretical categories. All right, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. <laughs>